Okay, hi everyone. Is that my sound good? Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Barry Sipra as our colloquium speaker. Barry is a freelance mathematics writer who has been a contributing correspondent for Science Magazine and a regular writer for Siam News. He wrote the first five volumes of What's Happening in the Mathematical Sciences, a publication by the American Mathematical Society, and is the author of Mistakes and How to Find Them Before the Teacher Does, a calculus supplement. Although that title is a bit funnier written than spoken, so check it out on paper. Um, he received a PhD in mathematics from the University of Maryland College Park, and after that completed postdoc positions at MIT, the Ohio State University, and St. Olaf College before returning to freelance writing in 1987. Barry has received a number of distinctions over his career. I'll just mention two here. In 1991, those are the only two. Yeah. <laughs> it's still a number. Uh, in 1991, Barry was awarded the Merton M. Hassa Prize for Expository Writing from the Mathematical Association of America for his article, An Introduction to the IC Model, which appeared in the American Mathematical Monthly in 1989. Barry also received the 2005 Joint Policy Board and Mathematics Communication Award for his, quote, lucid explanations of complicated ideas at the frontiers of mathematical research, or in his own words, for trying to explain what mathematicians are up to. On a personal note, I had the honor of having Barry in the audience for my first ever conference talk, which was at Siam Dynamical Systems a long time ago. And we have since talked about various problems in combinatorics and game theory over the years. And I've always enjoyed reading his columns about fun, surprising, and recent developments in many areas of mathematics. Today, Barry is talking about benefits of not paying attention, although I do hope we all pay attention to his talk. And there are handouts circulating through the room too, which I didn't realize before, but if you don't want to pay attention to this talk, you can think about what's on the handout. Um, so grab one of those for now or after the talk too. Thank you and welcome Barry. Oh, Rebecca, thank you. And I hope people will somehow communicate to me if I cannot be heard properly, just, just wave your hand or, or something like that. Um, We'll see how long, how well this works. Okay. Again, th thank you so much, Rebecca, for that, that introduction. Um, uh, I have no corrections <laughs> to it, <laughs> um, ex except for the fact that the handout is a serious piece of, of, of mathematics that I hope people will spend some time playing with you know, either during the talk or afterwards or, or, or whenever, um, uh, the, this uh, talk I like to give, well, actually first, first things first, um, uh, oops, uh-oh. Ah. Well, this is gonna be problematic. My, my computer is not responding. To its to my commands. This is interesting. It's not doing. Oh, good. <laughs> my my computer is frozen up, so I'm free to talk about other things. <laughs> um, see if see if you have any luck with it. Um, I I sort of wonder if it's the combination of Zoom and. And um, and keynote and and so on. At any rate, this this oh. is a good time. Ah, okay. What did you do? I have no clue. Okay. So <laughs> so first things first things first. I do want to give thanks to, to Jed Brown and Rebecca Morrison for the invitation and the arrangements. This is this is an awfully nice invitation and a chance to to come to a really really beautiful area. Uh, I haven't been to Boulder in, in over 30 years. Um, so when we were planning the trip out, I, I thought, you know, look ahead at what kind of weather to, to, to expect. So I went to a, um, a, a website that I rely on to, to give me sort of forecasts a week out. 
my wife and I actually came out on Sunday and we, we spent a few days in uh, the Rocky Mountain National Park area. And I just want to know, you know, do, do I need to bring a you know, winter coat or boots or anything? So, but I was happy to see, look ahead of the weather, told me last Sunday it was going to be high as 65, low as 37. The website told me Monday, again, very, very, th this is actually sort of like Minnesota weather right now uh, where, I, where I'm based. And then I said, Tuesday, <laughs> 532. And, and, and Wednesday, it said, chance of snow with accumulations from 156 to 260 inches. Fortunately, this seemed to be kind of a glitch in, in the, um, the, the, the site, uh, but it was a little eye-catching. Um, uh, but kind of the, the, the type of thing that, um, I did want to know what to what to expect. And it's good to know that the range wouldn't get into the 140s or anything like, <laughs> like that. Um, should say be, before I talk, um, as Rebecca said, I, I've worked most of my career as a freelance mathematics writer. I report on things going on in the mathematical sciences. And one of the things that's always been is I go to a lot of, I've, I've gone to a lot of talks at a lot of mathematics and, and other you know, math-related conferences. Uh, and I found myself very frequently in the, the uh, situation where I just don't, I'm just not following the talk at, at all for, for various reasons. Either it's way over my head or the speaker is boring or a combination of, of all the above. And, and so over the years, I've, I've learned to just sort of let my mind wander and just not worry about paying attention to the, to the, to the talk uh, and, and just do things. Um, I was told actually once by a, a distinguished mathematician, it's, it's always good to come to a math talk prepared with something to, to think about, okay? And I heartily recommend that to, to you all. If you're like me and you haven't done that, that's one of the things this, this handout is, is about is to take a look at, you know, you might find that of, of interest or just dream up your own stuff, okay? Or what I'd really like to invite people to do is come down sit and work on a couple of the puzzles that I've come up with that I will be talking about um, and, and just, you know, help yourself and, uh, and, and then, you know, give a shout out if and when you, you, you solve something. Um, I should say, as, as a freelance writer, I'm, I'm sometimes asked, you know, well, what, what does that amount to doing? Um, oh, I, I, I should say, my reaction to this is, is what the forecast. Um, any rate, uh, when I'm asked, what is math or science journalism? I found over the years, some wonderful explanations. Lord Northcliffe, who is actually the founder of British tabloid journalism, said journalism is a profession whose business it is to explain to others what it personally does not understand. And that certainly describes my experience reporting on mathematics. People are doing wonderful, deep mathematical and, and applied uh, results. And I have no idea what they're really up to, but it's my job to uh, convey that to, to other people. Also, uh, G.K. Chesterton said a journalist is a person who works harder than any other lazy person in the world. And that also fits me to, um, uh, a, a, well, part of it fits me to a T. Okay. I won't say which part. Okay. Um, one of the, the nice things about work as a freelance writer is, you know, I, could, I can take time off and just read a book and call it professional development. And so over the years, you know, I, I, you know I, I read lots of literature. I'm always looking for instances where mathematics or, or science, but especially mathematics sort of enters into literature. And I, I, I find it arising in, in some of the strangest places. So just a couple of examples of finding math in literature. The opening sentence, of a novel by Alex Kate Schulman was, I have learned to mistrust symmetry in the decimal system, okay? This was in her novel, uh, Memoirs of an Ex-Prom Queen, which I uh, heartily recommend. Um, Rita Dove, who was the poet laureate uh, back about 30 years ago, 
um, has written actually a number of poems on mathematical themes, specifically mathematical themes. The one that the, the excerpt that I particularly like, I don't think she meant as mathematics, but she said he's weary of analysis, the small predictable truths um, in a poem that is about other, other things. And finally, okay, one of my great finds, and this again is about um, 25 years ago, Sandra Gilbert, who's a poet, um, has written many, many you know, chapbooks of, of poetry. Uh, she, her, her, she has a book called Kissing the Bread, which was a compilation of poems she'd written over the, over the decades. And the, 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 the cover kind of attracted me. I picked it up in a bookstore and thought, oh, I wonder if there are any math, book, any math poems in here. Turned out there was a whole section of math poems under the general heading, when she was kissed by the mathematician. Uh, and that was the title of this specific poem that's about a page and a half long. So I, so I won't you know, uh, read the whole thing, but the opening line to it, it's just great. The morning after the night she was kissed by the mathematician, she woke with a new intelligence. And now I asked my wife if this had been her experience. <laughs> okay. She said she did wise up, but by then it was too late. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, I am going to switch now to the actual talk itself. Okay, so what I, I, I really want to talk about is um, some problems, some things I've come up with over the years when I stop paying attention to a talk that I'm in the audience for. Okay. And this is again what I, I, I really encourage people to just, you know, let my voice wash over you as background white noise and drift off and, and think about other things or, or pay a little bit of attention, but, um, uh, um, you know, uh, see what you can come up with, okay? Um, and especially this, this handout or, and, and I apologize, to the, the people who are in the Zoom audience that don't have the, the handout, you'll have to make up your own. Um, or for the people in, in the audience here, uh, I've drawn something on the blackboard and the people in the Zoom audience will just to imagine something having been drawn. And anyway, if there's a question mark in it, ignore the little period that makes it a question mark and try to figure out what is, what is this thing, okay? so. Again, you know, if you're not prepared to think about your own problems, think about some of mine and, and report back to me. What I'd like to do though, then is, is present some things that, whoops, I have done when I really should be doing other things, okay? Um, and if this will cooperate again, good, okay. The first uh, thing I'd like to talk about is, is what um, uh, I like to call the bricklayers challenge. It's also called building barricades. The, the name was, was suggested by Richard Guy, um, who took an interest in, in the problem. It's also called I'm No Gauss. Um, and it starts with a column by Brian Hayes, who did the computing science column for American scientists for, for many years, and has a wonderful blog called bitplayer.org. Um, and so again, you know, especially people with their laptops open, you can, you can go there and, and start reading his stuff. Anyway, Brian did a, a, a column uh, uh, about 15 years ago called Gauss's Day of Reckoning, in which he was collecting variants on, there's a famous story about that Gauss used to tell about himself as a, as a child in school, where the teacher assigned the class the problem of adding up a bunch of numbers. And the story is typically told, add the numbers one to a hundred, okay? So what is the sum of the numbers one to a hundred? And Gauss realized, little 10-year-old Gauss realized, well, you know, if you add the numbers up backwards, you get the same sum. So whatever the one answer is, it's the same both ways. So if you add those all together, one plus 100 is 101, two plus 99 is 101, 
all the numbers, you know, written forwards and, and, and backwards, they all add up to 101. So if you add everything up, whatever the sum is, you, you have it twice. And consequently, 101 times 100 is twice whatever the sum is. And so the sum must be 101 times 50 or 50, 50. And the story is, as Gauss liked to tell it, was he wrote it out on this little you know, slate chalkboard and slammed it on the teacher's table and said, there it is, ligat say. Okay. So Brian was collecting variants of the story, not only you know, what was the actual problem that, that Gauss was, was assigned, but also was this really the way that Gauss went about solving it? There are many, many different ways to, to solve this. And then he was also collecting variants about, you know, it was a cold winter's day in a dimly lit room and a, you know, a brutal teacher, you know, who was angry at the city, you know, and, and, you know, different people have added different levels of, of, of story. At any rate, when I read this column and I asked myself, well, how would I have solved this? if I were in Gauss's class as a student, not his class as a mathematician. Here's the problem. Well, what I would have done was I would have started with one and one plus two is three, one plus three plus three is six, one plus two, you know, I would have just done it, okay? Piece by piece, very carefully checking that I had done each arithmetic step correctly, okay? Um, Let's try something a little smaller. Okay. How about adding up the numbers one to four? We know we get 10, but how would I have done that? Very plottingly, I would have said, well, that was pretty quick. I start with one, then I get three, then I get six, and then I get 10. Okay. And I, I would have stopped and examined each partial sum along the way to make sure I had done the arithmetic correctly. And then it occurs to me that, well, you know, just to be sure, let's add the numbers in a different order. Because one thing I do know about arithmetic is it doesn't matter in what order you add numbers. So if I start with two and then add three, I get five, add four, then I get nine, then I add one, like, oh, I get the same answer. Okay, I'm happy, okay. But I noticed that the two different approaches, let's see how this goes. Along the way, I got the partial sums one, three, six before I got 10. Here I got the partial sums two, five, and nine, and those are different. And so here I really did become a bit of a mathematician, said, that's sort of nice. I got different partial sums. Can I do it again and again get different partial sums? And the answer is yes. Okay. Four and three gives seven, and one gives eight, and two gives 10 again. So I got all the different possible partial sums from one to nine, okay, in you know, in one way or the other. So that's what I just said, okay. Can we do this for, for, for one to five, add up to 15? Well, the answer is no. It took me about 20 minutes to figure, to, to realize this. The reason is each arrangement gives four partial sums just like you had three partial sums with, with one to, to, to four before you get to 10. Here you'd have you know, four partial sums, but there are 14 different partial sums less than 15. And four does not divide 14, okay? Going back, if you remember, you know, we had three partial sums uh, you know, for each arrangement of the numbers one to four, and they accounted for all nine partial sums. Three does divide nine, okay? Okay, so say, so can we do it for, 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 for six? And here the answer is clear, you know, now, here the answer is maybe, okay? Each arrangement would give five partial sums, 
before you get to the 21, which is the, 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 the and there are 20 numbers less than 21. So there are 20 different partial sums you're aiming for. And by God, five does divide 20, which means there's a chance. Okay, but can it actually be done? And this is again, where anyone who wants to is now invited to come down and try for yourself. Okay, and that's what this little board is. There are cells of bricks, okay? Links one, two, three, four, five, and six. And the idea is to arrange them across the, 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 the board uh, uh, doing this. So anyone, okay, actually two people at a time are welcome to, uh, to, to come down. Turns out, okay, I'm gonna give the game away. The answer is yes. And here's one solution, but I'm, I'm going to get it off the board before you can copy it down. Um, uh, just trust me, I've actually checked this, okay? If it could do it for six, could we do it for eight? Okay. It turns out be, uh, the, the same thing that prevented it from be, even being possible for five happens for all odd numbers, but for even numbers, okay, we can now look for five rows, each seven partial sum, okay, and five times seven is 35, which is the number of, you know, less up to 36, okay. The answer again is yes, okay. It has been done. Actually, I even did it. I can't hear either. I think that he accidentally got logged out or something. Yeah, it looks like it to me.
All right. Okay. 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 <laughs> One of the wonders of, of, of Zoom is that it uh, gives endless opportunities for uh, interruptions when you can get productive work done here. <laughs> so, okay. So, I'm going to continue talking, but you all should too. <laughs> so this, this question arises now, you know, can it be done for any even number? And then again, some little arithmetic or algebra says maybe, okay, but it is an unsolved problem. Okay. And, and I think one worthy of, 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 of attack. I will tell you what's known. Okay, or the last I, I heard, um, there are solutions for all even numbers up to 26. And then for a, some technical reasons having to do with efficient searching, okay, they've skipped and found a, a, a guy about 10 years ago, you know, wrote a computer program that just started kind of more or less you know, cleverly brute force searching to, to for, for solutions and found them for the num for all the numbers up to 26. And then he did 30 and 34 and 38, at which point the, 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 the amount of computation just was grinding to a halt. It's just too, it was too big a problem for whatever search algorithm uh, he, he was using. This has been extended a few years ago for the similar skipping over the multiples of four. It's now known for all even numbers up to 110, except for the multiples of four, okay, where it, it got, it's, it's stuck at, at, at 24. And I may be able to explain in, in, a, in a few minutes why it's easier to look at the numbers that are uh, not multiples of four, okay? And the, the real reason is that those are the cases where you have an even number of rows, okay? Um, so, yeah, so why skip the, the multiples of four and why call it the bricklayers challenge? I originally came up with this thing purely as, you know, a number a, arithmetic addition I, a problem. And I was writing out, you know, partial sums of, of things. And then I visited Richard Guy, who's a mathematician at the University of Calgary, um, who sadly died a couple of years ago at age 103, okay? He was a sprightly 90 year old when I was visiting him with, with this problem. And he suggested what he liked, he, he liked all kinds of wordplay. So he called these things building barricades. And, and I sort of, you know, like the, the, the name myself. It might be the one place where I get into the literature. At any rate, he said, picture a solution as a wall of bricks. So there is that solution I put early, up earlier as just numbers, okay? Each row is a row of bricks of, of, of width one, two, three, four, five, and six. And you can actually see the top row has them in, in numerical order, okay? And, but then there's a scrambled thing, okay? Each brick, each row has bricks of, of the appropriate length, okay? And the idea now is that no, you know, no bricklayer would ever have two, you know, bricks with a seam running, be, you know, from one row to the next. In this case, no two seams anywhere are vertically aligned, okay? And for n equal two, okay, it's pretty trivial, okay? For n equal four, or, or if you're going to the numbers one to four, okay, that was what I first did, okay? It turns out there are three more solutions. And here are all the different solutions. Now, of course, once you have a solution, you can permute the rows at, 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 at liberty. You could also reflect the whole thing. 
okay? And, the, you know, run the numbers backwards. But these are really different solutions. Um, uh, and yet you have to spend some time looking at, even I have to spend a lot of time double checking that I haven't uh, lied to, to my audience. I gave this talk years back and I said there were only three. And then I was thinking later, and I said, oh, geez, I missed one. <laughs> okay, anyway. Now for six, again, here's one, okay. And here it is in wood, and that's what's down here. The, 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 the idea behind the problem is mine. The woodwork was done by a friend of mine who, who, you know, in addition to being a really good mathematician, is a very, very good woodworker. And I encourage and welcome people to, at any point during or after the talk, come up and, and, and take a crack at it. Okay. So now let me try to explain why do you skip the multiples of four? Okay. Whoops, this is a notion that, that uh, Richard called rotary barricades. Here's a, a different, this is a different solution for, for six, okay? Let's duplicate it, okay? So we've got two copies of it. And now rotate that second copy. It doesn't change. So what's going on is you know, whatever you have in the upper left-hand corner, which is a one, you have the exact same thing in the lower right-hand corner. So everything across the top row, you've got the, the, its reflection or actual rotation, you know, in, in the, across the bottom row and the middle two rows, one goes left to right, one goes right to, to, to left. Um, and, and so the idea is, if there is a, a, a solution, if there is a solution with this nice rotational invariance, you can search for it a lot more quickly. As you're trying things, okay, you go down sort of a, a, a depth first search tree or some such you know, notion until you, you know, run into a, a problem and you have to back up. But if you, you know, say my solutions are, are you know, I, I want to see if I can find a rotationally symmetric solution. It's sort of, you're, you're, you're putting in twice as, you know, pieces twice as fast. And so you run into snags twice as fast and you, you back up. Okay. The problem, of course, is that there's no guarantee that they exist. Okay. They can only exist when you have an even number of rows. Okay, because you're basically pairing up a row runs this way and another row runs the opposite direction. Okay, they may not exist. Okay, but they do. They've been found for all, all the even uh, all the numbers up, up to 110, and you know that's kind of the secret behind you know uh, writing a program that you know will solve instances of, of the problem relatively quickly, okay? When they do exist, they're easier to find. The, the searches go more, more quickly, okay? So let me end this part of, of, of the talk quickly with just a summary of some of the open questions. Are there barricades for all even numbers? Okay, that's not known, okay? In fact, it's not known for 28 and 32 and 36 and, 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 and so on, okay. Are there always these rotary barricades, okay, when, when, when it's possible, when you have an even number of rows, okay? Again, the answer, you know, seems to be, to be yes. And finally, okay, okay, how many barricades are there for each even number, okay? The, the first question asks, you know, is the number positive? You know, are there any at all? Okay. The, the, the next question, you know, then is, you know, you know well, I, I mean, it would be perfectly happy if you could show, yeah, for n equal 516, there are no uh, barricades of, of any sort. At any rate, the conjectures are that these existential questions about the existence the answer is always yes. We're, 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 you know, it just, it shouldn't, yeah, you know, it, 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 they just have to exist. 
In fact, the number of, of solutions seems to grow rapidly, but, but, but by seems, we just mean, okay, there's really one solution for two, there are four for four, four, six. Actually, Brian Hayes, uh, uh, who inspired this, wrote a, uh, a simple program. And for n equals six, modulo permuting the, the rows, he found 2,187 different solutions, okay? Nobody, to my knowledge, has found or counted how many solutions there are to eight. But it seems, it stands to reason that the number of solutions grows quite rapidly. If it goes from one to four to 2,000 and change, you know, at eight, there are probably somewhere in the, in the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions. So what we have, the problem is we're, for large values of, of 2n, we seem to be, we, we think we're looking for a huge number of needles. The problem is that the haystack is growing super exponentially, okay? Because, you know, every row, there are n factor, you know, there are two n factorial ways to arrange the bricks. And there are, you know, n minus one, at, at any rate, you know, for, for just for six, there are six factorial ways you could arrange a row of bricks. And then there are four rows. So you've got 720 to the sixth, uh, to the fourth power, which is, you know, like a hundred billion, okay. Clearly you can cut that down to maybe a few billion, okay. And certainly that's within the, the, the realm that a computer can, can pretty easily search for, at least these days. But by the time you get to eight and even 10, I think trying to find, you know, how many there are is, is, is going to require some some new ideas. So please, if you make any progress on this, you know, let me know. Okay. And in fact, if you find a proof, okay, or you know, a disproof, whatever you you you, you find, my party recommend is publish it. <laughs> okay. So that with that we'll end the brick layer. And how much time do what's when Oh, perfect. Okay. And folks are free to, to you know, leave or, or again, please come down <laughs> and, 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 and have a, have, have a go at, at this. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Are there, do we have any questions? Yeah. Um, can you clarify what we for? Like, why would why wouldn't all the arrangements make for a Ah, okay. Um, I'm going to apologize to the Zoom audience because I'm going to draw the blackboard. Oops. Okay. Zoom audience can maybe hear the clicking of the of the chalk. If you put your one here, okay, and then say you put your, your two here, you cannot put a one there. So, so you know, you, you, you know, this seam has been used up. Come, come down and try for yourself. <laughs> Bring a friend. <laughs> no, no, the, 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 you know, the, the idea is that you want to put the bricks out, but then, you know, once you've laid a brick down, it has, it, it has created, you know, it's accounted for a scene. So no brick, you know, on, on any of the rows, either above or below it, can, can you know, stop at that same scene. Okay. But it's best understood if you try. Come on, come on. <laughs> so that'll teach you to ask questions. Any <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> but 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 pick a friend to come with you. <laughs> and
And by the end, and in the next 10 or 15 minutes, we expect a solution. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. I want to make sure I'm in the next talk. Okay. Whoops. Ah, perfect. Okay. So I, I want to switch to a completely different thing uh, that, again, I came across a number of years ago um, uh, and found myself kind of fascinated with it. It's down at the next table, okay? And I call it the Saul LeWitt problem because it was inspired by a, a um, work of art by the American artist Saul LeWitt, who uh, was one of the... Um, uh, minimalist artists and very famous. He's in lots of major art museums and, and kind of all over, but he did a lot of geometrical and combinatorial type of, of art, of, of, of work. And so I, I picked up this one book and it has you know, nice pictures that the Zoom audience cannot see of geometric figures and, and, and so on. And um, so he, he was this conceptual artist. He, he actually, a lot of his stuff, he didn't do the, the actual art. He gave instructions to other people to, to, to do it. So you'll, you'll see wall paintings that he did. This is in the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, this is at the, at the, at the Whitney. Uh, he did sculptures that have sort of combinatorial arrangements of, of geometric figures. Here's just a, 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 another one. Uh, this is one, I think, in Washington, D.C. Um, drawings and etchings, again, very colorful, very geometric, uh, some black and white. And then this one that I came across in this book that I was holding up for the audience here. And what he's done in this, when you look at it, is he's got the 16, or he's got all the arrangements of horizontal, vertical, up diagonal and down diagonal, the singles across the top, the pairwise combinations and the next row and a half, and then the three at a time, and then all, all four directions. And then this book had the, 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 the title of the piece in the lower right-hand corner, but you can think of that as clearly, that's the square that has none of the directions in it. So you know, each square either does or does not have a horizontal. It either does or does not have a vertical. It either does or does not have an up diagonal. The same. So there are, you know, each square makes you know a choice of the the the, the line is either there or it's not there, and that's why there are sixteen of these. And he put them in a nice little uh, uh, arrangement. The thing that I you know, notice when I saw this was, look at that second row. There's a horizontal line that starts at the left and it sort of continues from one square to the next, but it doesn't make it all the way across. On the other hand, um, and, and here I'll apologize to the Zoom audience that I, I don't have a cursor on my, on my computer screen. Oh, wait a second, maybe I, I, I can do it if I get out of this. Ah, here is a diagonal that goes all the way from one side or one edge to another. Um, uh, here's another diagonal that goes all the way from one edge to another and, and, and so on. Did you? Yeah, that's all they're seeing. Aren't I, am I not sharing my screen? It, well, let me, let me just go back and it, what, it, is the Zoom audience back? Okay. Huh. Oh, hmm. that's very strange. But anyway, I, I'll apologize to the Zoom audience. The, the audience here could, could see it. Anyway, you can see that certain lines you know, try to continue all the way across, but most of them fail. So the question I asked myself, and, and so what I did was I just redrew it, okay? Um, 
pushing all the squares together. So you really can see that that, that second row really has a horizontal line that goes three across, but then stops. But you can see some diagonals that the, there is a diagonal that goes all the way from the bottom to the right hand edge um, and a couple of others. The question I, I asked, well, that actually here it is again, just with the, the um, edges of the square removed. And I sort of like this because it's 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 its own little work of art. Okay, um, it's it's a bit of minimalism um, that uh, is sort of a, appealing. So the question is, can we rearrange? This is the question that occurred to me. Could you rearrange the squares? Lewitt put them in a particular order that had a logical significance to them. But what I want to know is, could I rearrange the squares? so that all the lines go from one edge to another edge, okay? All the verticals go from top to bottom, all the horizontals go from all the way from, from left to right. And the same for the, for the diagonals. So here's a little attempt to do that. Let's just sort of randomly put things in, okay? But now I'm, I'm sort of connecting some verticals there, oh, there I've got a whole row of horizontals. Um, here I've, I've got a, 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 a vertical and I'm doing well on, oh, there I've got some diagonals and I keep going, but this guy has nowhere to go, okay? Um, if you just try to place it anywhere in what I've already got, it just interrupts something or other, okay? Um, and for, for, for various reasons, actually what you can see is the first three columns have already have some squares in them. None of them have any vertical lines. And so this guy that you're trying to place now, it has a vertical line, but it has, it, it, it has nowhere to, to go. So what I encourage, you know, people to do is make your own and try it. Cut out a bunch of squares of paper, draw the various things, put a little dot on the bottom to prevent rotations. You know, if you rotate a horizontal, you then have two verticals, okay? And same for, for diagonals and, 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 and so on, okay? Or have your friend Lauren Larson make one out of wood. And that's what's up here. And again, someone should come down, okay? and have a go at it, okay? Here it is, can it be solved, okay? And I think I'm tempted to end it at, at this. Do you want to know the answer? Do you want to see the answer? Is anybody listening? <laughs> Shall I show the answer or, or an answer, okay? My computer knows how to do it. I won't tell you how long it took me to get Keynote to do this. <laughs> it can be done, okay. And part of the reason, I, so the answer is yes. Here's that solution with, with the guidelines. It's sort of lovely, okay. This is what I really like about this problem. There's an unexpected bonus here, okay. That's the solution. Let's take that column. It's still a solution. Let's take that top row, move it to the bottom. It's still a solution. And there's no good reason for that. It just happens, okay? The solution is toroidal. You can wrap it around the, the right hand, the right to left, top to bottom. You've got a donut. This problem lives on a donut. One thing this means is if you make multiple copies of, of the solution, it tiles the plane, okay, in a, in a very nice fashion. You can tile the plane and there's the whole plane tiled or as much as Zoom will let it. Why is this? Okay, 
There seems to be no good reason. Now, it, it does make sense that the horizontal lines should wrap around and the verticals should wrap around. But those damn diagonals, there's no reason that a diagonal that leaves at the top should come back and continue at the bottom. Okay, the problem doesn't ask for that, but the solution gives it to you for free. Okay. It also turns out, okay, now, now once you have that, you now know that, you know, once you've got a solution, you have all the toroidal, so you have 16 more, not to mention all the rotations and reflections and this, that, and the other. It works out, there are three distinct solutions. If you put the, um, uh, the, the solid one in the upper left-hand corner, which you might as well do now that you know it's toroidal, just wherever it is, just move it to the top and then move it to the right and, and, and you're good, okay? All three have this toroidal property and there's no reason any of them should, but they all do, okay? So things to explore on this is, well, you know, how many solutions are there really, okay? Why are they all toroidal? Now, and, and here, there's a proof, it's, it's not difficult because this is a small enough problem. You can just sort of do an exhaustive analysis and, and, and show it, okay? But there's no conceptual, I, I mean, it's all the was a conceptual artist. There ought to be a conceptual reason for toroidality and we just don't know. Finally, again here, are there similar problems, okay? That one can come up with also with this toroidal property, you know, you know uh, and, and this is something I've spent some time with over the years, um, but I don't have any of that. Um, I've tried to come up with problems of, of geometric type design, and I kind of like four by four grids, okay? I like to have a complete set of 16 something that you can try to arrange and then I've been trying to come up with other problems where the solutions are all toroidal. To date, I've failed. I, I just, I've come up with, you know, some, some problems. Some, I've, I, I have one that, you know, some of the solutions are toroidal, but then there are others that are not, okay? And um, I think I will end with that. And I will invite people to, first of all, ask questions, but then come down, and also, you know, if folks have worked on the, the homework assignment and have them ready to, to hand in, okay, I'm very keen to, uh, to hear about, about that problem. And aside from that, I thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep in mind, if you ask a question, you're going to wind up down here. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so if we, if we join all possible combinations for the rotary variation, like for the value of six, so if we uh, choose for all combinations that we have the rotary invariance for the like we will be rotating around and we have the second for all combinations. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I think there are solutions that are not rotationally invariant, right? Oh, for the, for the brick layers, yeah. probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the number of, of them. Uh, somebody did, did work it out. Um, uh, as as I, I, did, I mentioned the number 2000 something, okay. That's the number of total solutions, um, uh, modulo just permuting rows. Some of those solutions are rotationally, uh, you know, come in, in rotational pairs. So the, the number of um, rotationally symmetric um, barricades for, for, for six is probably in the, in the hundreds, but, but don't hold me to, to that, okay? There, there are certainly solutions that are not, you know, rotationally symmetric, 
And there's certainly multiple ones that, that are rotationally symmetric. I'm sorry. Ooh, ooh, in chat or? Um, hello. Um, yeah, I I wanted to ask as well a question. So I wanted to ask if you know what algorithms were used to solve these problems by the computer. It would be very interesting to 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 know how he when he put all the lines together. It was very interesting to see. The, the this is the bricklayer's challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know any of the details of the, the search algorithms. I, I do know that they, they I, I believe they, they looked for rotationally symmetric ones uh, and found them for, for all those numbers that are not divisible by, by four. Um, and I'm, I'm sh pretty sure they did just sort of a, a you know, after that kind of a, a, a bit of a brute force um, a, a approach, um, but I, I'm I'm afraid I, I do not know you know what kinds of, of search algorithms they, they use. But I assume it with some form of depth first. You just try stuff, keep track of where you're making a decision, and then you know when you get stuck, go back to the last decision you made, and you know, try something else and then see how far forward you get. Um, but exactly, you know, how far down in the search they, they would wind up going, um, I, I, I just don't know. Um, uh, the, um, I, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I, I'm also not sure if any of this has been posted on the archive or, or published uh, el elsewhere, um, so I, I I just haven't seen the the, the papers that, that describe this. I think the guy in in Italy who took it to 110, I think they did write up their results with some descriptions, um, uh, but I can't answer beyond that. Sorry. No, thank you very much. And I, um, I've also did math as a background, and it, it it's a very nice problem. So thank you for presenting. Oh, it. thank, thank you. you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Um, which one? That one or? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there it is. Let me, let me actually put it up. Yeah. I guess it's one of the things that's very like, I don't know if you thought about this all, but you know, sort of like the rows and columns, they're sort of proportional to this number of, like, the line. Four rows and four columns. Mm -hmm. But in the diagonal, you have like seven. No. Diagonal. No, you have eight of each. Okay. The, 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 the nature of the problem half of the squares have an up diagonal, half do not. Ah, okay, sorry. Okay. What I'm saying is that it's easier to see when, when the actual squares so like are there. Seven locations per column. Oh, I see. Oh, oh. Yeah. Where only like four locations per Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess that's Did you have a guide for them who were trying to come up with these solutions? Or was the approach that you had? What I will tell you is, you know, when I when the problem occurred to me, I just you know took some some you know stiff poster board and cut out little two-inch squares and drew the, the lines. You know, like the, um, um, you know, I did, where did I show it? Oops. I'm, I, oh, oh, this isn't showing me the, the 